So consciousness and the unconscious. So we've spoken about consciousness, and then we've talked about non-ordinary states of consciousness. And then there, now we're going to talk a little bit about the unconscious. Okay, does that go with everybody? Just trying to get the whole picture step by step as we go through. So obviously the early developments, and now I'm talking about modern science. Okay, uh, ancient traditions knew all about, or they had their maps of the unconscious. Um, I'm talking now about the advancements in modern science. So we'll start with, with Freud, Sigmund Freud, everybody knows him, right? And he brought some very important uh, teachings, very important teachings into the maps of the human psyche. Uh, projection, transference, counter-transference. These are very, very important concepts that we are living with all the time. Now, everybody knows what projection is, right? This is a projection. It's a projection on a screen. Now, how do humans project? We're actually doing it all the time. And we're usually doing it from our unconscious. And we are projecting all kinds of things from our unconscious onto other people's situations, people, places, and things. And only as we become aware of this, we're back to consciousness and awareness, awareness, awareness. As we become aware that we project and that it's a normal human experience and that we're probably doing it most, if not all, of the time, then we have the possibility to actually work with what's inside of us and, and make changes that lead to a more liberated or fulfilling life. Transference and counter-transference, do you want a quick sentence on that? Does everybody understand the concepts? Quick sentence, okay. Transference is what happens um, when we take an experience. It, the, the word that Freud used to describe it actually comes from the German word for overcoat. And what he is trying to convey, it's as if we take a parent's overcoat and put it on someone else. So his model of transference and counter-transference really stems from the, our, our biological birth family story, our early childhood story, in which we transfer onto other people our unresolved um, issues or longings. People just often think it's just issues, but it isn't. It's equally weighted with longings. I need you to be my good mother, good father, is as deep as I hate you because you're showing up as my bad mummy, bad daddy, okay? They're, they're all transference. Counter-transference is when the other person picks up the script and gets into your story with you because somehow it matches something in their story. Is that enough to go forward with? So he began also talking about the unconscious, then Jung, Carl Jung came along, and his work on um, synchronicity, archetypes, dreams, I mean, Jung left an enormous body of work, written work, um, an extremely thoughtful and deep thinker, a lot of maps, a lot of interesting work with what he was starting to call the collective unconscious. And so he was seeing things that he had no explanation for, that he started to call synchronicity that there was a something that was happening that we didn't quite understand that seemed to connect two people or objects with people that he could only term this synchronicity. He worked with archetypes and trying to define and understand the archetypes as, as energetic forces that actually, they're not an intellectual construct. It's just not something we talk about, that archetypes are actually um, have a presence and a quality and a, a force with them that we all connect to. And of course, who can forget the shadow? Probably a piece of Jung's work that made one of the most, the largest contributions to shadow work. What lies in the shadow in our unconscious? That which we've forgotten, that we've repressed, that we don't see or understand anymore. So there's three things about knowing. There's what I know. <clears throat> there's what I know I don't know. For example, I do not know how to play the guitar. I do not know how to speak Japanese. 
I do not know how to fly a plane, so I know I don't know these things. And then there's what I do not know I do not know. And that's the really interesting part. What I do not know I do not know. That's the stuff that's down in the unconscious. Here we, have, here we have a little map that I drew up of Young's work. And you can see in the, it's trying to give a map that helps us understand a little bit better. In the middle, there's the human, there's us, with our conscious ego, what we know about ourselves. Okay? Our, our known identities. I am a woman, I am a sister, I'm a mother, I'm a grandmother. I'm a, you know, all of these things that we know about ourselves. I'm a Canadian, okay? So we have all these lists of identities of, of what we know about ourselves in the world. And then we have, so that's the self-image, the persona, which can be, again, these, all of these boundaries are permeable, they're fluid. Okay, they're not at all rigid. Everything is always ebbing and flowing through them. Our subconscious memories, things now we're, now we're in the unconscious, things that we've forgotten. Does everybody remember what they were doing when they were two years old? Yeah, it's a bit blurry, eh? I mean, unless something very specific happened to you at that age, then probably you have not so many memories. You may have an overall sense of how things were. The actual memories um, are usually a little bit blurry. Then we have our shadow or our denied psychic material. These are things that have been denied out of us or, or um, repressed out of our family environment, our culture, religious exposure. Um, educational exposure, where things that have not been accepted. So, for example, classic would be, uh, it's changed more so, but in the era that I was growing up in, uh, men were allowed to be angry, women were not allowed to be angry, women were allowed to be sad, men weren't allowed to be sad. If a man was sad or a boy was sad, let's roll it down younger, if a boy was sad, he was being a girl, right? Or a sissy, right? Well, I don't know, maybe things have changed a lot, but it was still happening when my children were young in the schoolyard and places like that. So there's this repressing of certain things that are just basically human. So women are allowed to be sad, they're allowed to be frightened, not allowed to be angry. Men are allowed to be angry, not frightened or sad. It's interesting. So all of that stuff gets sifted down into the, into the denied, into the shadow. If you, if you weren't allowed to be spontaneous in a certain way, if you had spiritual experience that you're that you, your immediate environment did not know how to manage, or their teachings and upbringing, uh, it fell outside of what they believed, then they would repress that in you. And all of that goes in inside, and it creates body tension, and it creates an angst in the soul. It can create ongoing anxiety. So a lot of things that we end up having to deal with in adulthood are coming from these areas. Then we have, uh, this is all still Jung's map, we have the animal, and that's the opposite, there's an L there, but shouldn't be there, opposite sex qualities, and, and so we have the inner male and the inner female that are, that are uh, in balance with each other when we are feeling at our best balance, and disowned, can be disowned or repressed. And so it's coming to terms with the fact that we have these fluid boundaries with all this material. And then he took it right out to the collective unconscious and universal and archetypal processes. So this is Jung's work. Um, it was astounding for him to map this out in his era. He didn't have a lot of support in that direction. So we'll move to Roberto Assagioli. He is a, an Italian psychiatrist. In his work, um, he was a colleague of both Freud and Jung, and he departed from their thinking. It's as if he took what they had developed and said, yes, all good, and I'll sort of take these really good pieces and put them into my map. And his work, if you're not familiar with it, became known as psychosynthesis. I highly recommend it. And um, 
This is his model of the self. In the center, you're going to see there is the conscious self, the I experience. And in this small circle in the middle, this is the me. This is the I experience. And then in the middle, you have what's readily available, what we can bring in pretty quickly that we know about ourselves and that what we know how to do and be and all of those things. And then you have your lower unconscious, which is everything that, you, that one has forgotten about, everything that hasn't been resolved or shifted down and sifted down into the lower unconscious. Please do not think of that as being a bad thing. A lot of people immediately, oh, on the lower unconscious, it must be bad stuff. No, actually, we may find difficult things there. We may find unresolved grief or difficult things that we went through that we did not know how to um, integrate or work with or grieve. But at the same time, we will find wonderful treasures. We will find aspects of ourselves that become free and liberated. Things we didn't, we forgot about ourselves. We kind of say, oh, this is familiar, or it feels like we didn't even know. So no one should feel afraid of what's in their unconscious, even though there might have been scary experiences. <coughs> Does it make sense? Then we have the higher in conscious or the super conscious. Now, of course, a lot of people want that. Oh, I want the higher. Well, I have news for you. Most of the time, you don't get much of that unless you're willing to do that. Okay, the more, the more the lower unconscious expands and we work with the material there, the more easily we can actually access the higher unconscious. Now, what's in our higher unconscious? Our higher unconscious is connected to, let's call it our higher self, it's the phrase that is sadly used. Uh, the realms, the higher realms, the divinity realms, the transcendent realms, so it's access to that. Okay. And our higher unconsciousness holds our higher qualities, higher wisdom, higher humor. You know what I mean by higher humor? Being able to see the cosmic humor not having a laugh at your neighbor, okay? That's not higher humor. Having a laugh at yourself could be higher humor. Okay. Um, higher wisdom, a more encompassing wisdom. So higher qualities. This is, we all have internal access to these things. And it is for us to, to enlarge or expand the field of consciousness until it encompasses everything that we can until those boundaries have gone and there's no more internal boundaries. Oops, sorry. Back. I need a little lecture, I'll get this. Okay. We're back to Stan Groff. Okay. He classified non-ordinary states of consciousness into four categories. So sensory experiences, motor manifestations, and then biography, perinatal, loss of memory, body memory of birth, and the transpersonal. So what we're going to focus on today is um, these strong body memories. I again highly encourage you to familiarize yourself with his work. You will learn so much about yourself, just even reading his work, never mind doing it. And uh, the big addition that Stan Groff made into the maps of the human psyche, psyche was including our, the body memory of birth. And we can all say, well, we all arrived on the planet, right? And to do that, we had to come through a woman's body, right? One way or another. And that is true. And yet, it is our strongest memory. And the reason is, is because it is a death. We incarnate, and we incarnate into a developing human body in the body of a woman. And then the birth process begins, okay? So first matrix is the water world of mother's body. We're in an amniotic fluid, so we're actually in a water world. We're not breathing air. We have an umbilical cord. We don't need any food or water. Everything nourishment is fed to us straight through the placenta and through the umbilical cord. In a good pregnancy, we are happy, we're comfortable, we're relaxed, we're picking up all kinds of good experiences from our mother's experiences and our family, their family experiences. If mother is well, 
if her, if her situation is reasonably good, if her diet is good, things like that, then obviously that experience, the world of first matrix, is usually a very good one. Second matrix is the labor's commenced, the cervix is not opened, and this is the hell realm. There's no escape. It's enormous pressure um, is brought on the child as the uterus prepares itself to try and the muscles have to pull open the cervix so that the baby can leave mother's body. And to do that, the, the uterus is kind of wringing itself out with deep spasms, which the mother will feel like bad cramps, and allowing the cervix to be open so that the baby can begin the, the kind of hazardous journey out of mother's body. So then third matrix, so that feels like a trapped victim. So anybody here who has an experience of like claustrophobia often feels trapped and like a victim and, and stuck and doesn't know how to go forward, you probably have some second matrix material that needs to be resolved. Third matrix is the struggle. We, the cervix is open, we now have that few inches to work our way down through mother's body before we actually exit the body. It's called third matrix. And much as the, the first matrix is a water experience, the second matrix relates more to the earth. It feels like buried alive, as people have it described it. The third one is fire. They really do connect to the different elements. It's a fiery experience, and it's when a lot of the um, opposites start to come to balance. So predator and prey, male and female, the cosmic clash, good and evil, all of those things are part of third matrix energy. Fourth matrix is a death. We die from the water world of mother's body to be born into the air world of planet Earth. So we always focus it on being a birth, and we haven't considered that it's a death. And it is. It's a death, and it is the strongest body memory. Anything else that happens after in biography will usually only reinforce um, experiences of the perinatal material. Uh, any questions around that? Or is it pretty clear? Um, I'm wondering, um, how does um, a cesarean birth that kind of alters that process? Is that there's a wonderful book about it, uh, there are probably a few more at this point, called Through a Different Doorway. And uh, it does immediately change, it does change tremendously. Um, having worked with a number of people through the years who were born C-section, there's some common things that have to be resolved within them. Um, you know, if you take, uh, you know how birds have to peck their way out of the egg? And if you take pity on them and open the egg, the shell for them, they die. They actually have to peck their way out. So a cesarean section may save a mother's life and it may save a child's life, but it actually doesn't give the child that opportunity to do that struggle and have that achievement of I've given birth to myself. So that's a piece that people have to work through. They will often have the sitting back waiting to be rescued thing going on for them. Things will get difficult and they'll just cop out or opt out because somebody else will do it, somebody else will rescue them, somebody else will take care of it, it'll get done, it'll get managed, etc. So there's very interesting kind of beliefs that will come from those experiences. Stan also, um, he, he talks about the condensed experience and that's part of his map. And um, in this, in the condensed experience, what you will have is you will have elements like an archaeological dig, or even better, a peanut butter and jam sandwich. Everything's stuck together until it seems like one experience. So maybe something happened to you in birth, and it happened to you uh, in a biography, and it happened in a past life, and it all holds the same energy. It all holds a similar energy. Does that make sense, or would you like an example? Example. Example. Okay, I'll be autobiographical. Um, in biography, I had two experiences where, um, through circumstances, I, I nearly died from things to do with my throat. Um, uh, one, when I was a little older, maybe about eight years old, was after they had taken out my tonsils that ruptured, the st stitches ruptured, 
and I was hemorrhaging, and I had to be rushed back to the hospital, and la la la, anyway, I'm here, so it worked. Uh, when I was much younger, um, I was under the age of two, sitting in a high chair, maybe fussing, hungry, something, and my mother gave me a square of chocolate. And you know what happens with chocolate, it gets kind of gooey and slippery on the outside, and then it's still hard in there, and it went to the back of my throat and stuck. And the next time my mom looked at me, I was completely blue for how long I hadn't been breathing. Anyway, she and my dad managed, after considerable effort, to get the chocolate out of my throat. And so those two things within themselves had their own little piece of trauma, right? But it condensed into something that, happened that was part of my birth. And it condensed into something that was related in a past life. And so stuff around my throat, until I did a lot of that clearing of it, um, clearing of the body memories of it, grieving it and, and giving it catharsis, um, a lot of it would collect in my throat. And um, does it make sense what I'm saying? So you can have even a part of your body, I've seen this over and over and over again, where there's a certain place in people's body where there's chronic tension, chronic pain, chronic something. And when they go working with it, they find that there will be let's call them body memories, the trace residue of difficult experiences that they have lived. Now another thing that Stan Groff added was that he, he said that people have always uh, over-focused on psychological and emotional things as being like the main trauma in somebody's life, and they are and they have their place and they are not to be diminished in the power that it can have and the effect that it can have. But it's been, there hasn't been any place for the physical things that happened. So when there's been a severe illness or there's been an accident or there's been some kind of a, a physical, where your actual, your physical life in that moment is threatened, that that actually leaves a larger trace in, in the body. The body remembers that. It's interesting, isn't it? So, in, for people interested in doing their healing work and understanding about themselves, it's always good to do kind of a little story of my life and make a little list of all the things that you know, or ask your parents or an older sibling or an auntie or somebody who can give you some information about various and things that happened in this lifetime. And then you can have an understanding of, oh, I see, those couple of things all hold the same energy. Oh yeah, and that's how I feel when I'm in that situation. Isn't that interesting? Okay, so this is a little map I drew that um, shows the individual into the, it, it's combining the work of Freud, of Jung, of Stan Graf, and of Stagioli, and trying to put into place our individual mind and how it connects to up there the great mystery. So if we look, we can see this progression, first of all, to our personal unconscious. What's in our personal story, our personal unconscious. And then it's going to go to our family. Okay, we are actually connected to our family unconscious. People may not even realize this, but whatever's held in your family unconscious, your parents, your grandparents, people around you, your ancestors, you know, in a lot of, in a not, a lot of uh, indigenous uh, traditions, they honor the ancestors. In a lot of spiritual traditions, they honor ancestors, whether it's a specific day during the year or a certain prayer or a certain way of, of honoring them. They find a way of honoring the ancestors and trying to understand, you know, what came down the line through the ancestors, what their ancestors went through, and, and see, like, am I carrying any of that? And it's very obvious that in, in many situations, we are carrying things that happened to our ancestors. And how do we, how do we lovingly make that separation through a conscious effort of honoring whatever happened, honoring our ancestors, honoring whatever did or didn't happen, the omissions and the commissions, and then putting it into the larger perspective. So if it needs some way of respecting it or honoring it or grieving it or forgiving it, but that liberates us and it unhooks us. I remember once many years ago somebody saying to me who'd come into therapy saying, you know, I'm not quite sure why I'm here because I really think I've kind of dealt with everything, 
But there's this one thing that just keeps coming up that, okay? And so we worked with it, and after a period of time, the person said, okay, this isn't even mine. I'm seeing now that I've been carrying, you know, I'm learning that I've been carrying stuff that isn't even mine. And when we get that we're walking around with a knapsack with all kinds of stuff in it, somebody's belief systems and somebody's behaviors and somebody's actions, and we picked up energetically stuff from that, and we're carrying it, and we don't have to. Then we have our national unconscious. All we have to do is look at, say, the national unconscious of the Japanese is vastly different from the national unconscious of, choose any other nation, Canadians, okay? There's a very big difference of what sits in their unconscious, right? Their rites and rituals and language and culture and habits and behavior. And then we have the global human unconscious, and then we go up to the collective or universal, and then we go up to the green mystery. So, does anybody have any questions around this? Yes? Sorry, could you just repeat your question? What what means? Um, my question is about uh, Kundalini. Kundalini. Did, did you have already Kundalini experience, and uh, what does it mean exactly? Okay, Kundalini comes. The, the word Kundalini comes from um, from far the Eastern traditions of uh, they're not natural belief systems here, so. The Kundalini, Kundalini awakening, and the Kundalini is a life force that in some Eastern traditions they believe that it lies sleeping in first chakra and that the awakening of this force will open each of the chakras until your seventh chakra is open and you will have enlightenment. Now Kundalini awakenings can be very um, shattering. Stan Groff's former wife, uh, passed away quite a few years ago now, uh, Christina Groff, um, they met. Uh, she, she was a friend and student of uh, Joseph Campbell, whose work we're coming to in a minute, and she said the only person who can help you is, is a man named Dr. Stan Groff, and so she tracked him down and they met and ended up having a relationship. And she was in a, a deep awakening, kundalini awakening. She had all the shakes and the vibrations and the memories coming up as in a very rapid way opening from first chakra up, everything held in the lower body uh, was opening and had to be dealt with. And so these kind of rapid transitions um, are not usually easy or pleasant. Uh, if people think of, oh, I'm sitting in the lotus position and there's a flower opening on my seventh chakra and I'm just at peace and everything is just beautiful. Well, it could happen like that. I just haven't met anybody that it happened like that before. It usually involves a whole lot of cleaning out. It's sort of like the monsoon river hits the dry riverbed and it just sweeps everything out of its way. And that's more like a rapid kundalini awakening. So. And one needs to have a, a good model and a good teacher to work with and a good process to work with to integrate that kind of uh, process and awakening. And it can go on for years. It sometimes is months, but it can off and on go on for years. Okay. So, everybody know who Joseph Campbell is? the great mythologist of the last century. If you don't know him, please, at least, if you don't want to read, at least go and watch the Bill Moyers interviews. Um, it's so worth it. Um, one of the great gifts that he gives us is he really took something that's called the hero's journey. And as a mythologist, uh, the hero's journey for him was the penultimate mythology. It was the key mythology for the human experience. And in it, there's three stages, the departure, the initiation, and the return. Uh, so I've opened them up a little bit, um, and uh, I've added in a few of my own 
things on this, so we'll, we'll, we'll go with it until we get there. So the departure, the hero's journey. And everybody knows what the hero's journey is, right? Yes, good. Okay. So the departure, what does the departure look like? I can think of a couple of classic departures, right? Everybody watches, has seen Star Wars, the film, maybe Luke Skywalker hanging out on a boring planet, looking at the sky, longing for something really exciting to happen. A little, uh, you know, the little beep beep machine comes along and he has a message in it and then he takes that and he's eager to follow and find this princess who has a message and find out who this man is, Obi-Wan Kenobi, and the next thing you know, they're off on the hero's journey. Now the thing is, is Joseph Campbell was the advisor for the first three films, and you can tell the difference between the first three films of that series, which are rich in archetypal mythology of the hero's journey, and then unfortunately he passed away, and they didn't replace him, which is a shame because there's lots of other good mythologists who would have stepped in and kept the mythology alive instead of just a story. So, you know, and then we have uh, The Wizard of Oz, that's a different departure. Here's Dorothy, little girl, kind of minding her own business. Tornado comes along, the next thing she knows, she's not in Kansas anymore. Okay, that's another departure. It's like, wait a minute, I was just in my house and now I don't know where I am. What happened? I'm in this strange place. How did I get here? So those are the two most common departures. I'm looking for it, I'm looking for it, or when I find a book, and you know, when I take a course, and I, you know, and I go do this, and I go into that ritual, and I'm looking for it, I'm hungry for it, or I'm minding my own business, and the next thing I know, I have no idea what's going on. Something's happened, and I'm here. No. So the departure in our world can be, I'm seeking for it, or it can arrive. And sometimes the departure can be precipitated by some very everyday experiences where it's very challenging. So it can be an illness, it can be a change in career, it can be giving birth, it can be losing your job, it can be graduating from school, it can be getting married, it can be getting divorced, it can be the loss of a loved one. All kinds of things can cause the departure to start. When you realize, oh my gosh, I have this diagnosis and I don't know what to do. I better go get some help. That's beginning the journey. Refusing the call. Okay. This is an important thing to look at. What does refusing the call look like? Well, in the, in the stories, I'm sure those of you who have children, you, you read them to your children, or when you were a child you read them, or you find themes in movies, but there's someone who refuses the call, and then the whole kingdom goes to sleep or the whole kingdom turns into an ice world under the tyranny of something. So this is refusing the call. My favorite story in refusing the call, can I tell it? You should know it. It's the story of Jonah and the whale. Everybody know it? Jonah refused the call. Now what happened to Jonah? This story is so rich in mythology. So Jonah was considered to be a teacher and a prophet. And one day he gets the message that he should go to, and I forget the name of the city, maybe it was Antioch or wherever it was, and he was to tell the people there that, that they were doing things wrong and they had to change their ways. And he went, oh no, I'm not going there. Mm -mm, I'm not going there. They're, they're really tough people to deal with. I'm not going there. So he catches a boat going in a different direction. Okay? Ever done that? Don't want to go there. I think I'll go over there. So Jonah gets on this boat. And a storm comes up, a storm like nobody's ever seen. And the captain is worried, so he starts jettisoning all kinds of cargo because he wants to save his boat and save his crew. And they can't figure out what's happening. The storm came from nowhere. In the meantime, Jonah's fast asleep down in the bottom of the boat. The storm gets worse. Somebody thinks, well, we're going to have to start. People are starting to you know, get ready to jump, jump boat. So somebody goes down and wakes up Jonah and says, you're sleeping, look what's going on. And then Jonah realizes and he comes up and he says to the captain, 
He says, this is all my fault. I was supposed to go there, and I refused, and I came here, and this storm, this is a result of what I've done. That was mythology, remember, don't? <laughs> <laughs> don't take the story literally, it's mythology. So, he says, I don't, throw, don't put your crew overboard. Throw me overboard. I'm the one who's done something wrong here. So John goes overboard and gets eaten by a whale. And he spends three days in the whale thinking about what he's done. Until finally, where does the whale spit him up? On the beach of the town that he was supposed to go to. But now, he's exhausted. He's got burns on his body from being inside of the whale's stomach. Okay, he's not in good shape at all, and he still has to give the same message. So that's what refusing the call looks like. Now we can take that story into our everyday life, where we've seen, oh, I'm going to deny this or avoid that and pretend, and then we have all of our habits and our behaviors to try and avoid the thing that we don't want to do, until we realize that the thing that we don't want to do is here in front of us, and we have no way around it. We may have gone all different ways trying to avoid it, but it is right here in front of us. And it's the one thing that we have to do to go forward. So that's refusing the call. Initiation. The hero's journey includes lots of initiations. And we can look into mythologies, and there's tons of them. Um, initiations, uh, oh, all different flavors. And, the, probably the most important ones deal with difficulty. Okay. So on the hero's journeys you will find that they have to go through a dark forest. They have to face a dragon. They have to encounter Darth Vader. They have to deal with a wicked witch. There's always a troll under the bridge. There's always difficult, dark things that they have to initiate themselves with. There's always traveling companions, walking alone. Walking alone and traveling companions, we can think in all of the stories that there's somebody. In the Wizard of Oz, Dorothy had a straw man, a tin man, and a lion, right? And they were all looking for something. Remind me, the lion wanted a heart. No, the lion wanted courage. The tin man wanted a heart. And the straw man wanted a head, right? He wanted a mind, a brain, something. So looking for something and hoping that the journey will bring it to us. There's always a connection to the magical realms. Always a connection to the magical realms. So we have companions. We have um, people who are accompanying us. We have, uh, they may accompany us for a short while, then they, some, some, we may kind of make a graduation, and we have to maybe say goodbye to that person who's accompanied us on part of a journey, and then we meet somebody else who's going to accompany us on our journey. And those beings can be physical human beings, they can be a dog or a cat, they can be um, uh, spiritual beings and spiritual guides. And they all have their place in their teachings. So we have access to um, spiritual realms. There's always a magic ring, a magic wand, a magic word, a good fairy, a, uh, the force. There's always something that is there that we can use when we have a challenge or trouble. As I said, there's always a part where we have to walk alone a little bit for a while. That's an important initiation, where it feels like I'm alone, there's no guides. Um, again, being autobiographical, uh, an initiation, uh, I did lots of them when I was in Brazil on all the trips that I did there. And one of them was we climbed a mountain. We opened a ritual at the bottom, it was Pedro de Gava. Um, just in Rio de Janeiro, and there's two areas where it's a technical climb where you have to use ropes. And I'm not really a climber or hiker, it's not kind of my thing, I do other things. But I wanted to do this, this felt like an important part of initiation. So we opened the work, uh, we, we drank the dime at the bottom, and we began climbing. And it's the kind of climb that you really have to go um, all the way to the top, you have to start very early before the sunrise and go to the top and then get down to a certain point by the end of the day. Otherwise you have to stay on the mountain. You cannot, at a certain point, you, you can't go down in the dark. It's just simply too dangerous. So I had everything that I could think of to hope and pray and cross that we would be able to get past that point because I wasn't too keen on spending the night on the mountain. 
for a bunch of reasons. And so what was fascinating was, was um, on the way back down, there was twilight was coming, and we were, the group was more or less together. A few people had gone ahead in, in a moment, and I had handed my, the, the knapsack to my husband, and in it it had a flashlight and maybe our water bottle or something. And there was people in front of me and there was people behind me on the trail. And we had done most of like the difficult stuff. And uh, going down rock face with ropes and down a chimney and things. And in a nanosecond everybody was gone. The people who were right in front of me were not there anymore and the people who were right behind me were not there. And I found myself in kind of a very slanted meadow on what I thought was the path and there was nobody and I couldn't hear anybody. And I thought, oh great, I'm alone on the mountain, I don't have water, I don't have the flashlight, I don't have the whistle. I, mm. So I thought, okay, what am I gonna do? I can sit here and wait and hope that I'm on the trail. I didn't see how I could have gone off the trail. I didn't know where everybody else had vanished to. If the people ahead had speeded up, okay, lost them. If the people behind had slowed down for some reason, okay. But both at the same time seemed a bit strange. It was a remarkable synchronicity. So I thought, well, okay, I'm in the forest. I'm just going to pray. And I stopped and I stood and I spoke to the mountain. And we'd been encouraged to ask the mountain to help us. To talk to the mountain and ask the mountain to help us and asked nature to help us. So I did. So I asked the mountain, and I said, Mountain, and I asked my guides, could you please help me get down? And in that moment, some fireflies lit up. And the fireflies showed me where the path was. So I started walking very quickly, just following this glow. At least I think it was fireflies. They looked like in this little glow. It's like the path sort of lit up, and I just followed it. And then I came to a couple of people who said, we're staying here to direct people because it's a tricky turn. People could easily go left instead of going right on getting down. But for that period of time, which seemed like a minute and a lifetime, I felt completely alone and the only thing I could count on was spirit and the mountain to guide me. So we have, all of us will have that experience where there's something that we're going through, and it is an initiation, where we actually need to go through it alone. And it may look very different for each person, what that looks like, but you'll know when you reach it. You'll know, oh, yeah, okay, I'm alone in this moment. I'm sitting here doing this or whatever, and I'm going to breathe, and I'm going to be with it, and I'm going to know, okay, this is a kind of initiation, and how do I grow in this? How do I expand in this? How much heart can I bring to myself in this moment and to, into this experience? Okay. Dark nights and difficult passages. Now, everybody has dark nights and difficult passages on their journey. I've never met anybody who can look at their life and say, no, no difficult passages, no dark nights. I've never met anybody. Maybe it doesn't exist or... I just haven't had the fortune of meeting somebody who's had or is having that kind of life because I think it's just part of being human. You know, everything that I've learned about being human teaches us that, as the Buddha says, no one escapes illness or suffering. One of his great truths. So we all have dark nights and difficult passages, and what that will look like will be quite unique. Then there's the near death experience. Uh, this is also part of the initiation, it's certainly part of the shamanic initiations. Um, in the feeling that whatever we're experiencing feels like a near-death. Uh, we can also have an out-of-body or near-death experience, and that can be spontaneous, or it can be precipitated by something. For some people, it's an illness or it's an accident, and they're actually physically near-death. So all of these are part of the journey. And then there's the return. Okay. So we've, we've done our journey, and our journey is a journey within a journey. Right? We're in our life, which is a journey, but we have journeys within the journey. Okay. So in mythology, there's the return. The hero returns. Remember, we're talking about the hero's return journey, not the life journey. The hero returns. The hero has gone off. The hero has done whatever the hero needed to do, save the world, get rid of the nasty planet people, whatever it is that they've had to do, they've done. Okay. Now they're the hero. They come back, and what happens next? 
So the return is, and remember those are stories, that's mythology. In the hero's journey, we return bringing all the wisdom, all the learning, the teaching, and the growth. And we now bring that as a form of light into our everyday life. We bring the best of our experience into our life and all the teachings. Now, what happens if we refuse the return? Not going back. Uh, many years ago, I was uh, staffing with uh, Stan Groff and Jack Cornfield at, at a large retreat down in the States. And um, it wasn't in, in my group that I was uh, facilitating, but it was in one of the other groups. But the staff, it, every night we'd get together and we'd talk about some of the challenges, how they got managed, how to continue managing them and support it. Or if there's somebody having a certain kind of process, um, what we could learn about that process. And so this person had come from New York City and they'd driven up in their Porsche and they were really like this total, you know, um, addicted to work, type A kind of person. And they'd gone into their breathwork experience, their first breathwork experience, and they refused to come back. Nope, I am in this beautiful, peaceful place and I am not coming back. They wouldn't open their eyes, they wouldn't get off the mat, they wouldn't sit up, nothing. Sent everyone away. Tell my sitter to go away. Tell Stan Groff to go away. Tell Jack Cornfield, go away, I'm not coming back. Okay, refusing the return. Probably for the first time in this person's life, in this hectic, crazy, New York, loud, noisy, hard pressured, you know, probably work 60 hours, 80 hours a week. This is the first time they had peace, quiet. Didn't have something they had to do. The phone wasn't ringing. There weren't people banging their door down for meetings or something. Anyway, it took all of the best tactics on the part of the senior staff to support this person to realize that they could create some of that in their everyday life. And then obviously, that they needed to make some changes in their everyday life if they were so unwilling to go back to it, but that they could not stay there. Everybody has to come down from the mountain. We can all climb the mountain, and we can have our peak experiences. We can have our profound connections, our mystical connections, our spiritual awakenings. But in the end, we have to come back from that. So we do have to make the return. And then what do we do? We bring that with us and try to uh, raise the quality of our everyday life for ourselves, for our family, and for everyone else. Okay, so here's a little image. Um, take a moment. You're in your journey. If you haven't consciously begun it, it starts the other side of this bridge. All you have to do is Begin. And taking a moment, what would be consciously beginning your journey look like? For some of you, it might look like making some changes in your career, your behaviors, your habits. For someone, it might look like finally finishing school. Get that thesis finished. For someone, it might look like going back to school. For someone else, it might look like forgiving. For somebody else, it might look like something completely, right now, I couldn't even think of. Or maybe there's something really difficult in your life and you've been doing this. I'm not going there. Okay, well, guess what? This bridge leads there. But if you trust it, a lot of good and healing will come from it. So my deepest encouragement Today to you is to begin your journey consciously. Okay, the self. Here, the following couple of pages is, um, is this is a very loose, fluid definition of what is the self, where we started a few hours ago, that has been uh, developed through 40 years of working with people uh, it's a question I would ask students and workshop participants and clients. Who are you and why you're here and what's the self? And, and through the years have developed something. The true self seeks wholeness and unity within the community, so within yourself, being whole with yourself, being whole with the community, being whole with 
nature and with the divine. Everybody's true self seeks that. And if we're not in harmony with that, we won't quite feel right. Now we're all unique. What one person may need as far as connecting with nature might be, somebody might actually need to live in nature where somebody else is quite happy to have, you know, three plants on the windowsill and that's enough nature for them. They feel very connected to nature, they talk to the plants, they water them. Right. So everybody's different. It doesn't mean we're all going to go and live in the woods. It doesn't mean that we're all going to live in a community together. It means that we feel in harmony within ourselves and how we are living our life. The self is an energetic being, a life force of being uniquely individual and yet connected to all that exists. <coughs> the self contains a sense of I, a center of pure consciousness center of awareness of being human and of a being, that I am a being, a multifaceted, multifactorial being. I am physical, I am emotional, I am intellectual, all these different ways of being. While living on planet Earth, the self experiences life through the body, the personality, the mind, and the feelings. Self contains and is the contact of the whole person. The self, while experiencing itself as having different parts, is one unifying center. So that the multifaceted sense of self, all the different roles that we carry, the you at work, the you at home, the you with your three-year-old nephew, the you with your with your lover, the you in your classroom when you're trying to study and whatever. Those are all different parts of you. The you as a sister or a mother or a brother or a son. All of these are parts of you, but all together they make up a whole. This notion of being a self is also what creates the experience of separateness from others. So here we are having this unity experience, and at the same time we have a sense of separateness. And this is very Zen. I'm one with everything, and I'm me, and give me my space, please. Right? I'm one with everything, but you're stepping on my foot. So how do we balance that between me and me and my life and me and my boundaries and being one with everything? And this is a study. This is something we learn. It's, there's no little certificate saying you've graduated. Until our last breath, this is something that we are learning. While we live in the world of physical reality, which is composed of matter, the self does not conform to the rules of this world. It's part of a world that transcends this world. Does that make sense? We are of this world, but we are in this world, but we are not of this world, and we are not in this world. We are very sad. We are here, we are now, and there's some part of us that transcends all of that. And how do we keep that in harmony? How do we have one foot here, one foot there? A connection with our heart with this, a connection with our heart with that. How do we manage to walk in life like that? We can call this self whatever we want. It's just vocabulary, the soul, the spirit, whatever words you're comfortable with. And the self has an eternal essence that reincarnates. So this again comes to personal belief systems. As I said, this is just a definition that's developed, it's fluid, it will continue to evolve. I trust people will continue to contribute to it, perhaps even this afternoon, uh, with some new thought that can be added to this definition. Or some experience will happen that will cause me to go, oh, I need to add this, I need to take that out. So. I wish you well on your journey. I wish you peace, health, happiness, goodness, prosperity. I wish you consciousness. I 
gives you awareness. May we wake up and stay awake. And when we fall asleep, not if, when, when we fall asleep, that we wake up. Or that somebody very kindly wakes us up. That's why we have friends and colleagues and community and spiritual community. And so someone can say, mm, you're asleep right now, wake up, wake up. Time for questions. You need to speak loudly. Oh, I'm sorry. So I know my question makes sense that it's in regards to Joseph Campbell's work. Mm -hmm. So with my friend, we've been trying to read it for a while right now. So we try to read uh, the little details and phrases. But it's very tricky to read because it impacts a lot on our dreams. First, we have really weird dreams. And we do not really feel that we have the tools to understand and to accept the knowledge and the information and the interpretation of the mythology and all that he's trying to communicate. So I would ask the kids if you would have any piece of advice to help us read him because we've been trying really hard but we want to give as much effort and put as much love as we should in that book, especially if you without so, well, I'm, I'll do my best to answer your question. Um, yes, you, people can find some of these really brilliant minds difficult to read. And that's why I suggested watch the Bill Moyers interviews where Bill Moyers makes it easier, okay, through his interviewing techniques. He brings it more to the general audience to understand. The other thing is, is about dreams, is I do not personally believe that there is a kind of a dream dictionary. Uh, for example, if, I, I always use this one because I love cats, I had cats, and you know, I use the black cat because the black cat is loaded with symbology and meaning. But if I was to have a dream about a black cat, for me, it's a wonderful dream because it would be about one of my former cats, um, maybe or Omega, as he was known, um, and it would be a great dream. But if somebody else had a dream about a black cat, it could mean something totally different. Okay, black cat is witches familiar, or black cat don't let it cross in front of you. Or, so the meaning that things have in dreams it can be very individual, and I think if you. If you're trying to interpret your dreams either through Jung's or, or uh, Joseph Campbell's work, that you're, you've really set yourself a very hard task. There, there are other people who have written who have uh, different tools at working with dreams uh, that might be more simple. I think that if you look at the dream, that everything in the dream is you. It's us. Everything is the dream. And that our psyche has simply um, put on a play for us to understand something. So it may contain elements that are archetypal. It may contain elements from our everyday life or our biography. But the core thing is how do we feel in the dream of whatever's happening. So it's not so much about interpreting everything that's there, but how do we feel about it? You know? If I might say, maybe I express myself wrong, but it's not that we're trying to interpret the dreams based on Campbell's books, but maybe the sponges, I think we agree on the fact that we read it. When we read books, we, we're sponges. Like we, it really impacts our day-to-day -day life, and the impact that I feel personally on the very personal perspective is that it will really go deep in my soul or whatever I have inside and try to show me the meaning that the author tried to put in those specific words. So this, I, this is excellent. Yeah, but it, it can be really um, essential with Campbell. It can be really uh, strong. It's really a feeling, it's not anxiety, but it's really strong. Something that's 
sometimes I will express like, okay, I'm not reading this now. I really maybe need to go through all the other contemporary authors or maybe Cascadera and the dream art or maybe anything else to help me gain tools and means to understand Campbell's mythology and the way he's trying to explain it. So I'm, I'm not sure what your question is. How do we tell them? <laughs> how, how do what? How do I read Campbell? Uh, in, a, in, in small steps, read small sections of it, meditate on it, and intersperse it with, I mean, unless you're at school and you're writing a thesis or papers on it where you're obliged to study it deeply, but I would say go slowly, step by step, and uh, I would say maybe get some work, do some work in personal therapy. If some things are going so deep with you, perhaps work with somebody in the transpersonal field who might help you understand why these things are having such a strong impact within you. That it isn't, you know, it's possible that some of the work that you're reading, some of the particular examples or the sections that you're reading are striking a very deep chord within you and that there's something inside of you that's responding to that that is longing to be addressed not just in his words but in your inner reality. So I would encourage you to find a transpersonal counselor and to work with what's being awoken within you and as to why it feels so deep or so strong. Thank you. You're welcome. welcome. Any other questions? Yes, over there. Uh, you were talking about the different steps, uh, like the departure, initiation, and what if you're stuck in those dark nights, nights and difficult passages? Like, where is your inner guide then? Like, how can you reach out if you don't see it anymore? This sounds like a really classic second matrix experience. Um, reading Stan Groff could be really helpful. Um, in, in, in the second matrix experience, what we have is that is the classic, I'm closed off from everything, I'm shut off or disconnected from everything that is good. So first matrix, that water world of not hungry, not hot, not cold, not uncomfortable, everything's just good, thank you very much, has disappeared. Now everything's difficult and uncomfortable. And it is the roots of stuck, blocked, victim, no way out, no exit, um, connection with earth and darkness and, and some of the kind of archetypal connections will be of, of prisons and of extremely difficult situations where you can't move, where you're stuck, you're in a landslide, or all of these difficult situations that can happen to people, right? So those are the kind of connections. And we can think of the words of, of uh, the great teacher Jesus when he was on the cross, when even he said, why have you forsaken me? Okay? So that second matrix experience of nailed to the cross, you can't move, you can't get off. Um, so these experiences can, be, can feel profoundly isolating. It is at that time that we actually need to have somebody accompany us in that journey. And again, I encourage people to find a um, holotropic breathwork process. is a wonderful process. Just look it up online. You'll find uh, certified facilitators in the area, and do some breathwork and start to start to grieve out that experience of feeling blocked and stuck and cut off from the light, cut off from that which is good, cut off from that which is nourishing or peaceful and and understand, put it in perspective, that it's a passage. What we don't want to do in those kind of difficult passages is sit down. What I will often say to people is don't pitch your tent beside the sea of lost souls. And certainly you don't want to go swimming in it. Okay? Winston Churchill in the Second World War. I was born in England just after the war. My parents lived through it and my father fought in it. Um, Winston Churchill said, when you're going through hell, you keep going. <laughs> Even if you go very, very small steps, you do not stop, you don't sit down, you don't pitch your tent in darkness. Even very small. And that's where we actually develop these, these kinds of passages when we look back on them. Because when we're in it, it's 
we're kind of in survival a little bit, right? But when we look back on it, and if we've made as much as we can um, intelligent, wise choices about how to manage what we're in, so we seek out good help, we read inspirational literature, we take care of our bodies, we make sure our nutrition is good, that we're getting the sleep that we need, we have our medical checkup, we do everything the best that we are able to do. And even if that means time off work, for example, or if you're at university telling your professor you're going through a tough time and you need a, you know, a month delay on handing your paper in or something, but we take care of ourselves when we're in that really difficult place. And sometimes we, we, very often, we really need somebody. So whether it's a breathwork workshop, a transpersonal counselor, a psychologist, whomever, we need somebody to help us. Okay. These kinds of experiences, uh, modern science will say, mm, you're depressed, here's a pill. Oh, you're anxious, here's another pill. Oh, you're having strange experiences, here's another pill. Okay, I am not against pills. I think that modern science is has given us enormous gifts through technology and medicine. And I think used wisely, that can be extremely useful in many, many ways. But in situations such as this, dark nights, difficult passages, spiritual emergency, it, it can be part of a program that helps us go through, but it cannot be the only thing, because it won't work. As long as it's part of a more holistic program. So yeah, you don't stop when you're in a difficult passage. You work with it. And you try and keep that perspective. Oh, this is a difficult passage. There will be a beginning, a middle, and an end. And it's usually a body memory. I mean, unless it is somebody's had a bad diagnosis. I'm a cancer survivor, so been there, done that. And you know, having a difficult diagnosis, it's a, it's a difficult passage. I'm not gonna in any way under diminish the power of that and that um, you know but each person knows how they're going to face it how they're going to go through it they have no idea what how the what the outcome is going to be but what we can choose is how we are going to go through it and how we're going to deal with it so it's basically a choice to get out of it well sometimes we can't get out of it because it's inside of us yeah. yeah that's that's refusing the call if we see it as a call into something, you know, then that's, that's where it'll take us. It'll take us on a journey of self-discovery. Okay, a couple more questions? Yes, gentlemen. So I have a question more connected to the first part. You've uh, talked about the very large number of ways that one can use to reach non-ordinary states of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Some with sacred plans, some with activities, some with non-sacred substance, I guess. How do you, is there, um, if, if I translate that into a toolkit, or different paths that one can take, do you choose a path according to the intention, but you don't know where it's going to lead you? How do you, how do you, is there first anything that you would qualify as bad or good in those different paths? And if not, how do you choose? Well, when you go into a restaurant, how do you choose what's on the menu? You choose what you like, what you enjoy. Or do you go into a restaurant and go, yeah, I didn't like the restaurant. The last time I was here, I ordered the chicken and I really didn't like it. But you know what, I'll have the chicken again. So, I mean, if we think about it, I mean, people do that. People keep doing the same thing over and over and over again in their life. But if we think about it, life is not that difficult if we go by how we simply live our everyday life. How do you choose your toothpaste? You know, how do you choose what you put on this morning? So it's not so different. It has to feel right. It has to feel right. There has to be something inside of you that says, yes, this feels right, this feels good, this feels like it fits me. I would often say to people, you know, how do you know? I don't know if your shoe is comfortable on your foot. You know. So for me to tell you this shoe is comfortable on my foot, so it should be comfortable on your foot, no, that's not going to work. So I can't tell you that, that this path is better than that path, or this way is that better than that way. 
because all good paths with heart are that. They are good paths with heart. I also personally believe there is something, um, James Hillman, the American uh, psychologist, he writes about this, he calls it the soul's code. And he says within each of us, there is a something, a calling or a code that calls us and unfolds us the same way. The example he uses is the acorn knows it's going to be an oak tree. Well, if you look at an acorn, it doesn't look anything like an oak tree. But inside the acorn, it knows it's going to be an oak tree. And all it needs to do is grow. And then one day it's an oak tree. So there's something transcendental about that inner experience that is guiding us. And I also believe in, in karmic agreements. I believe that some of us, maybe all of us, but certainly some of us, before we incarnate, we choose certain things. We may choose to be in a particular spiritual path or a mission or take a particular journey and that that will become evident to us <coughs> as we go forward. I hope I answered your question. Okay, well, it's been a pleasure being with you this afternoon. I hope you found it. Uh, Good luck, too. We all need a little luck. Thank you. Oh, thank you for today.